Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're going to talk about is the supply chain, and we're going to just start with the basics. What is a supply chain, or what is the supply chain? If you're looking at businesses, if you look at kind of back at our four P's of marketing, supply chain fits in that place. It's all about delivering the value, and the supply chain really helps to deliver the value to our clients, and we're finding ways to deliver more value step by step, because the supply chain really is the integration of all parts of our business from concept to getting it to our end client and all the things that goes in there. And the thing is, you realize you might find some inefficiencies along the way. You might find ways to be more effective in different parts, whether it's dealing with your suppliers, or your logistics, or your marketing channels. There's all kinds of things. So supply chain really is the complete package. And that's what we're doing. And that's why a lot of companies really look for supply chain help because they're helping to find inefficiencies, okay? And the supply chain itself, it's just a bunch of different techniques that firms use in order to integrate their manufacturing, right? Their production, their suppliers, their logistics firms, their distribution centers, the suppliers. I mean, all these things, what they're trying to do is make it much more efficient and effective throughout the supply chain so we can cut costs and pass that savings on to our client or to have those savings mean a better bottom line for us. And the thing is, this supply chain can really affect our business in a lot of ways. And if you kind of think about it in terms of streamlining your distribution, there's some things that you see every day when you go grab some food at McDonald's through the drive-thru, how supply chain has really, or supply chain management has actually helped make a better overall experience for our clients. Because one thing you look at is supply chain helps us reduce errors, okay? Because they're monitoring all these things and they'll see, wait a minute, we're seeing a lot of lost products here. We're seeing a lot of customers returning a second time within 10 minutes of their order. What's going on here? It looks like something, something's getting messed up here. They help see these errors and they help reduce them. So if you look at it in terms of your drive-thru, you know, when you go through your drive-thru and they got that computer screen that lists all the things you eat, like, oh, I ordered French fries, a hamburger, and, and a milkshake. It says it on the on the screen. So you see that, hey, that helps eliminate some errors because sometimes they forget to put something down. Uh oh it's on the screen right there. Okay, and then and inside, also there'll be a screen. Are all, is all that food in this bag? And they'll look and check and make sure, yes, these little things like that help you reduce errors, makes for happier customers, because no one likes to get back on the highway and see they forgot my cheeseburger, all right? Because that happens sometimes. And kind of going along with that, another thing that supply chain helps us with, with our distribution, it really can actually help have faster filling out of the forms and faster filling out and filling out of the orders. Because what we do is we kind of use supply chain to kind of come up with a standardized ordering form. So no matter who is ordering, it all comes in the same way. It's address, you know, name, address, quantity, delivery date. Simple. It's all set up so people aren't switching around. I can fill out my form easier. I mean, think about it. Why do we all order from Amazon so much? Well, I already know how it works. If I have to go through another website, I have to learn that. Amazon's already got me trained. It's got me to figure it, fill out that order as quick as possible. Just add to cart, ship right away. Done. And another thing that we look at is aside from you know reducing the errors in the order process, like with the with the screens. We're also using supply chain management in order to help reduce shipping errors, you know, so we're not messing up. That would be the, you know, checking to make sure when we put the stuff in, having the pick tickets to make sure, is there actually 50 cases of Coca-Cola going out on this pallet? They're checking those things. And the thing is, is supply chain isn't just about finding errors and making more efficiencies and eliminating inefficiencies. It actually does other stuff for you as well. It actually helps us, it helps management make marketing decisions. So for example, if we come out with our new Angus burger, well, one of the things supply chain will do is actually help us procure and find the supplies we need in order to make this new Angus McBurger that's so fantastic, right? I mean, that's one thing they do. Other thing they might do is try to figure out the best kind of shipping way, the best packaging way. I mean, think about it. Have you ever ordered something from Amazon and then you get an email, you know, a couple weeks later and they ask you, how is the packaging on this product? They're trying to learn, was it broken? Did we have not enough packing stuff, bubble tape around it, these kind of things? We're trying to figure these things out. And we start to see is, hey, look, there's multiple shipping options that we could use. That's why Amazon has the, oh yeah, you can get free shipping if you spend over 35 bucks. If it's, you know, five, you're willing to wait five to seven days. And they know that, look, there's people that want to pay, pay more money for making it quicker, a lot quicker, or next day. Hey, the supply chain helped us realize that, look, there's multiple shipping options we can offer that's gonna be a value to our clients. For me, I'm not too worried about it. Give me five to seven days of free shipping, I'm cool with that. 
Other people know I need this here by tomorrow, so I'll pay the extra 10 bucks for shipping. It all depends on what you're looking for. Another thing where you see supply chain coming in and working with our marketing decisions is you kind of look at our distribution and advertising programs. Because think about it, if Red Lobster is having Lobster Week, right? Well, supply chain needs to make sure that they know that this is coming so we can say, hey, look, it's lobster season so we can get this lobster to you in time. But don't make lobster season or lobster fest when lobster everything is on the menu when it's not lobster season because we can't get enough lobsters in. It's gonna to be too expensive for us. So we have to think about those things. So you know when it comes to those Black Friday deals, the supply chain people are like, look, if you're gonna have these deals for certain products that really got people to buy a lot, we need to make sure we have enough of those in inventory. We got to make sure everything's ready for that because you don't want to upset people by promising them all these TVs for $5 and you don't have any TVs. So that's where, you know, supply chain really does influence with distribution and advertising. We're really coming together. And if you think about it, you see supply chain working all the time. If you're in a class, it's a supply chain management kind of stuff, figuring out how many students are in this class, what classrooms are available, when can we fit them in the schedule, how do they cross over with other classes that students might have. I know for me, I teach an 8 a.m. class and there ain't no student in the world, well maybe like three, okay, they raise, the three people that raise their hand ever, that really want to do an 8 a.m. class. But the thing is, the people that schedule the classes have to look and they see that, look, all the business majors, they're free at 8 a.m. All the engineering majors that have to take this class, they're free at 8 a.m. The advertising people, they're free at 8 a.m. That is the only time we can get everybody together to get all the students in the marketing class. And that is supply chain working right there in your classroom. So I hope this helps you understand a little bit more about what supply chain is. Um, if you want to learn more, my buddy Nehemiah Scott has a great explanation talking about making a bike and all the different parts that come into it. I would definitely recommend checking out his channel and his videos to help out. But I hope this gives you kind of a rough idea. Basically, supply chain management is integrating everything from ideas to your client, processing all that kind of stuff together to make sure it all is a seamless, like network of things happening. That's why it's a supply chain. It's a seamless chain from idea to production to our customer. Bye. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here. And today we're gonna to talk about is the supply chain. And we're gonna just start with the basics. What is a supply chain or what is the supply chain? If you're looking at businesses, if you look at kind of back at our four P's of marketing, supply chain fits in that place. It's all about delivering the value and the supply chain really helps to deliver the value to our clients. And we're finding ways to deliver more value step by step because the supply chain really is the integration of all parts of our business from concept to getting it to our end client and all the things that goes in there. And the thing is you realize you might find some inefficiencies along the way. You might find ways to be more effective in different parts, whether it's dealing with your suppliers, or your logistics, or your marketing channels. There's all kinds of things. So supply chain really is the complete package, and that's what we're doing, and that's why a lot of companies really look for supply chain help because they're helping to find inefficiencies, okay? And the supply chain itself, it's just a bunch of different techniques that firms use in order to integrate their manufacturing, right, their production, their suppliers, their logistics firms, their distribution centers, their suppliers. I mean, all these things, what they're trying to do is make it much more efficient and effective throughout the supply chain so we can cut costs and pass that savings on to our client or to have those savings mean a better bottom line for us. And the thing is, this supply chain can really affect our business in a lot of ways. And if you kind of think about it in terms of streamlining your distribution, there's some things that you see every day when you go grab some food at McDonald's through the drive-through, how supply chain has really, or supply chain management has actually helped make a better overall experience for our clients. Because one thing you look at is supply chain helps us reduce errors, okay? Because they're monitoring all these things and they'll see, wait a minute, we're seeing a lot of lost products here. We're seeing a lot of customers returning a second time within 10 minutes of their order. What's going on here? It looks like something, something's getting messed up here. They help see these errors and they help reduce them. So if you look at it in terms of your drive-through, you know, when you go through your drive-through and they got that computer screen that lists all the things you eat, like, oh, I ordered French fries, a hamburger and, and a milkshake. It says it on the, on the screen. So you see that, hey, that helps eliminate some errors because sometimes they forget to put something down. Uh oh, it's on the screen right there. Okay, and then and inside, also there'll be a screen. Are all, is all that food in this bag? And they'll look and check and make sure, yes, these little things like that help you reduce errors 
makes her happier customers because no one likes to get back on the highway and see they forgot my cheeseburger, all right? Because that happens sometimes. And kind of going along with that, another thing that supply chain helps us with, with our distribution, it really can actually help have faster filling out of the forms and faster filling out and filling out of the orders. Because what we do is we kind of use supply chain to kind of come up with a standardized ordering form. So no matter who is ordering, it all comes in the same way. It's address, you know, name, address, quantity, delivery date. Simple, it's all set up so people aren't switching around. I can fill out my form easier. I mean, think about it. Why do we all order from Amazon so much? Well, I already know how it works. If I have to go through another website, I have to learn that. Amazon's already got me trained. It's got me to figure it, fill out that order as quick as possible. Just add to cart, ship right away. Done. And another thing that we look at is aside from you know reducing the errors in the order process, like with the with the screens, we're also using supply chain management in order to help reduce shipping errors. You know, so we're not messing up. That would be the you know checking to make sure when we put the stuff in, having the pick tickets to make sure is there actually 50 cases of Coca-Cola going out on this pallet. They're checking those things. And the thing is, is supply chain isn't just about finding errors and making more efficiencies and eliminating inefficiencies. It actually does other stuff for you as well. It actually helps us, it helps management make marketing decisions. So for example, if we come out with our new Angus burger, well, one of the things supply chain will do is actually help us procure and find the supplies we need in order to make this new Angus McBurger that's so fantastic, right? I mean, that's one thing they do. Other thing they might do is try to figure out the best kind of shipping way, the best packaging way. I mean, think about it. Have you ever ordered something from Amazon and then you get an email, you know, a couple weeks later and they ask you, how is the packaging on this product? They're trying to learn, was it broken? Did we have not enough packing stuff, bubble tape around it, these kind of things. We're trying to figure these things out. And we start to see is, hey, look, there's multiple shipping options that we could use. That's why Amazon has the, oh yeah, you can get free shipping if you spend over 35 bucks. If it's, you know, five, you're willing to wait five to seven days. And they know that, look, there's people that want to pay, pay more money for making it quicker, a lot quicker, or next day. Hey, the supply chain helped us realize that, look, there's multiple shipping options we can offer that's gonna be of value to our clients. For me, I'm not too worried about it. Give me five to seven days of free shipping. I'm cool with that. Other people know I need this here by tomorrow, so I'll pay the extra 10 bucks for shipping. It all depends on what you're looking for. Another thing where you see supply chain coming in and working with our marketing decisions is you kind of look at our distribution and advertising programs. Because think about it, if Red Lobster is having Lobster Week, right? Well, supply chain needs to make sure that they know that this is coming so we can say, hey, look, it's lobster season so we can get this lobster to you in time. But don't make lobster season or lobster fest when lobster, everything is on the menu when it's not lobster season because we can't get enough lobsters in. It's gonna to be too expensive for us. So we have to think about those things. So you know when it comes to those Black Friday deals, the supply chain people are like, look, if you're gonna have these deals for certain products that really got people to buy a lot, we need to make sure we have enough of those in inventory. We gotta make sure everything's ready for that because you don't wanna upset people by promising them all these TVs for $5 and you don't have any TVs. So that's where you know supply chain really does influence with distribution and advertising. We're really coming together. And if you think about it, you see supply chain working all the time. If you're in a class, it's a supply chain management kind of stuff, figuring out how many students are in this class, what classrooms are available, when can we fit them in the schedule, how do they cross over with other classes that students might have. I know for me, I teach an 8 a.m. class and there ain't no student in the world, well maybe like three, okay, they raise, the three people that raise their hand ever, that really want to do an 8 a.m. class. But the thing is, the people that schedule the classes have to look and they see that, look, all the business majors, they're free at 8 a.m. All the engineering majors that have to take this class, they're free at 8 a.m. The advertising people, they're free at 8 a.m. That is the only time we can get everybody together to get all the students in the marketing class. And that is supply chain working right there in your classroom. So I hope this helps you understand a little bit more about what supply chain is. Um, if you want to learn more, my buddy Nehemiah Scott has a great explanation talking about making a bike and all the different parts that come into it. I would definitely recommend checking out his channel and his videos to help out. But I hope this gives you kind of a rough idea. Basically, supply chain management is integrating everything from ideas to your client, processing all that kind of stuff together to make sure it all is a seamless, like network of things happening. That's why it's a supply chain. It's a seamless chain from idea to production to our customer. Bye. 
Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today what we're gonna do is talk about some of the ways that information flows through a supply chain via Hostess cupcakes, okay? Because I figured this is something that we can all understand and really focus on today are some chocolatey goodness and with a little mint flavor. Why not, okay? Anyway, the first flow of information I wanna talk about is when information flows from the customer to the store. So when I was at the grocery store and I picked these things up, I walked up to the, the aisle, walked in the aisle, walked to the cashier, gave it to her, and then she scanned my universal product code, right? And that communicated to them that, yes, I'm buying this. So you have that information flow there, which seems pretty obvious, right? But the thing is, there's other ways that that information flows because now the store that I bought this from, they then need to communicate to their corporate buyer maybe and say, hey, look, we sold another box of our Hostess cupcakes we might need to order some more. So we have to communicate to them that, hey, we might be running low on our inventory, so you need to buy some more. So you're gonna be communicating to your buyer because some companies, some stores, they don't buy themselves. They have a maybe a regional buyer or something like that that buys for them. And so you have to think about that information flowing back and forth. Because we all know nobody wants to go to store for our Hostess cupcakes and there's none of them there. Of course not. And then from there, we might look at it in terms of the information flow goes from the buyer to the manufacturer. So this is when the regional buyer from my grocery store calls up Hostess and says, Hostess, we need some more cupcakes. Give us a few pallets of them, okay? And when you think about it, information flows back and forth in each one of these directions. Because I buy the I buy the hostess at the store, they t I tell that information to them. They also tell me information about the prices, so we have some information going back and forth that way. The store to the buyer, there's information that way saying, hey, we sold more stuff. The, the buyer might tell the store, hey, we've got more stuff coming. So you have information flowing going back and forth there. Then if you look at sort of the, the buyer to the manufacturer, hey, hostess, we need more. And hostess could be saying, hey, we got more coming on your way. You have those kind of information flows that way, but sometimes you don't necessarily have to go through a buyer or a wholesaler or a distribution center or something like that. What you might end up doing is seeing a store might communicate directly with the manufacturer. Maybe you've heard of manufacturer direct betting. Yes, that is information flow from the supply chain, i.e. the retailer, the store, to the manufacturer of the actual furniture saying, hey, look, we need a king size bed for an extra chunky guy all right and so they're communicating that way so you can have that kind of information flow as well and of course then the manufacturer may say hey we're shipping some of our beds to your store be ready for them so you can see the information flowing from that manufacturer back to that in store if we're cutting out the middlemen but the thing is we don't want to live out the middlemen or the distribution centers the wholesalers because what you might see is sometimes the store might be communicating directly with the distribution center saying you know instead of calling up the buyer calling up hostess directly maybe you're just calling your local you know distribution center saying hey we're running low because you run a few you know boxes of cupcakes out to our southwest store sure sounds good you do have information flowing that way as well also you might be flowing from the distribution center to the store saying hey we're going to be dropping off your pallets of stuff later today and then of course you would have the distribution center and the manufacturer they want to communicate as well because when hostess sends these off they're not sending it just straight to the to the grocery store a lot of times what they'll send it to is maybe they'll send it to a walgreens distribution center and then they can distribute it out so you might have communication going that way from the distribution center to the manufacturer and vice versa so it all kind of depends but the thing is is no matter if you're selling hostess cupcakes or or t-shirts or whatever there's a lot of information flow in the supply chain that's why it is vital that companies have really good communication channels when they're dealing with the supply chain because we want everybody on the same page because I don't want the store telling the buyer we need more cupcakes also telling the manufacturer that hey we need more cupcakes and also telling distribution center we need more cupcakes well, then all of a sudden you get 3,000 boxes of cupcakes instead of the three you really need, okay? So you wanna think about these things because you might see that whenever you try to order an Uber, right? And if you try to schedule it, if it doesn't work right, you're not sure. So you try to order another one and then two show up and you're like, ah, oh, man, now my Uber rating is gonna get messed up because the information flow wasn't good. 
that's why it is vital. Supply chain, it's about communication, getting information between places in a good way, back and forth communications, so we can see if there's any you know inefficiencies out there or anything's going wrong or what's up. It is really an important thing for a supply chain. So I hope this helps you understand some of the different ways that information kind of goes around a supply chain, because it really does. And hopefully your supply chain can get you some of these limited edition mint chocolate cupcakes. My kids are loving these, just by the way. I, of course, are abstaining because I am being a good boy for now. Bye. Hey, the fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. And today we're gonna to talk about is data warehousing and data mining. And data warehousing is just the collection of all this data that companies do collect on their clients, on their, you know, the clients, their customers, their suppliers, their competitors. It's all the information we're collecting. For example, when we came into the Serengeti National Park, they copied our passports, they took information where we're from and all these kind of things, so they can kind of collect that information. And the thing is the collection of the information, the collection of this big data is what's called data warehousing, okay? And so we have all this data. The thing is, we have all this data, but what are we going to do with it? Actually use that data to figure out the trends in that data. That's what's called data mining. So we kind of have this big chunk of data. Imagine a big square full of information, full of, sorry, full of data in there. And we got to figure out what are the trends? What does it really tell us? And so you drill down, you data mine into it to find what are some of the trends? What are some of the things we should be looking into? So for example, here, the, the Serengeti National Park will track, hey, where are tourists coming from? What are the ages of the tourists? So they can see is, okay, we see that we've had a big increase in U.S. travelers coming to the Serengeti. So maybe we should advertise even more in the U.S. because it's really resonating with them. So you'll see things like that. A thing in your own life, if you go to the grocery store and you have their like Max card or their super like saver card or something like that, whenever you shop, you swipe your card for those discounts. But they also track what you've been buying, your groceries, your toiletries, all these kind of things and they can actually figure out what should we recommend to them that's why i know when our kids were little we'd go you know buy diapers so we'd have six month diapers then nine month diapers and then we'd notice the coupons they'd send us oh well you know it's like we know you're not going to use the coupons right away so the next set of diapers is the 12 month diapers because they kind of used all that information drilled down and said hey these people have kids so we could try to sell them the, the bigger size diaper, or we might learn that, hey, they wanna, they have these little kids. Maybe we let them, we send them a flyer that says, hey, don't forget we have our special toy sale in December. So come and get your toys here at Meyer or here at Target or something like that. And the thing is for companies, you can really learn a lot. But the thing is it can be very dangerous as well because think about it, all that information we collect if someone else gets it or if we lose it, I mean, that's where privacy concerns come in. Because every time you download an app and say, I accept their terms and conditions, they might be able to take your pictures, your phone information, your addresses, your emails. Well, what do they use with that? What do they do with those things? Well, that's one of the big issues with data warehouses. We gotta keep those things private. So you spend a lot of money to protect your data warehouse, to protect that big data. Because the thing is that big data is worth a lot of money. Because if you can figure out those trends, you can figure out what's next. What's the next things my customers wanna buy? And so I can develop that product and sell it to them before they even realize it's there, okay? So I hope this helps you kind of understand the difference between data warehousing, that's the collection of the big data, and data mining, which is actually when you mine down and find trends and the real information. What do these numbers actually mean within that data? Anyway, I hope that helps you out. If you wanna learn more, go ahead and subscribe on our YouTube channel, Professor Walters. If you wanna learn more about the Serengeti, check out our other channel, Walters World. And we do all kinds of honest travel videos to help people out travel better. Just like we help students study for exams here, we help travelers study for their future trips. Anyway, wish y'all the best. Bye from the Serengeti. Hi guys, Mark here with Walters World and today what we're going to talk about is the supply chain and how information in the supply chain can flow and how we can manage it as a firm. Now, if you look at the supply chain in general, if you're a marketing student, remember those four P's of marketing? Price, product, place, and promotion? Well, place this is where the supply chain comes in. Trying to figure out what, basically deal with all the different ways that we have to deliver the value of our product, okay? Now, usually when people think about the supply chain, all they think about is the logistics side of things. Getting our product from the manufacturer to a distribution center, or getting our product from the manufacturer to the end customer, or the retailer, whatever you want to look at. Guys, it's a lot more than that. Supply chain is not just logistics. Logistics does go into it, but supply chain is managing all the relationships with the manufacturers, with the suppliers that are up here above us, 
with the distribution center, with retailers, customers, all these things in there. And that's why information management is one of the key aspects of working in the supply chain. Okay, but overall, the supply chain is all of the things we do to have an efficient and effective system of producing our products, procuring our products, getting it through the whole system, the whole supply chain, from the pig farm in Podunk, town, wherever, to our plate in our homes. So basically, it's integrating every step from concept to sales in the business in order to help the company make more money. That's supply chain management. Now, supply chain can help us. It can help us by streamlining distribution. Some of the things they can help us with is, you know, getting our orders filled out faster, um, eliminating inefficiencies that are out there, all kinds of stuff like helping with reducing shipping errors. So there's, there's redu having good supply chain management helps reduce some problems. Therefore, less problems, less cost, less waste. Also, supply chain does come into effect in marketing. Because if you think about it, if we're thinking about making Okay, we want to come up with a new product. Well, supply chain helps us find those suppliers. If we're going to make a new laptop, they help us find the right processors that are going to work on our tablets or a laptop or whatever. Also, the supply chain, what they do is they help us figure out what the best distribution network is or distribution way of distribution channel for our new product. Do we want to go straight to the customer or would it be best to go to a, a, a retail store or somewhere else in between? So they help with those things too. And also, if we're looking at shipping out our products, they'll find the best way for that. So yes, logistics do come into it, but also procurement. There's all kinds of things that come in with supply chain. Now, when you look at supply chain management, you're going to deal with a lot of people, and a lot of times you call, oh, we're going to deal with middlemen. Yes, you will deal with middlemen, and you know you don't want to do everything on your own because the middlemen can help you. One, location-wise, look, if our factory here is in India and our customer here is in Illinois, well, that's kind of a far way to go. If we have some middleman here, like a Best Buy store in Champaign, well, hey, that helps us get close to the customer. So the location of our middleman can help us get in co contact with our customers better. Another thing is they're informers. They inform customers why our products are well. They're kind of like a salesman. Okay? They help us sell our products. They inform them, the customers of the benefits. That's why when you go to a store, they ask, hey, what, what, what do you need? What are you looking for? So they can inform you of your options. So middlemen can help with that. Also, they also help with delivery. They're deliverers. You know, they, they help deliver our products out there. They set up things. I mean, think about it. If you're buying all new furniture, does anyone like putting together IKEA furniture? No. Squeak, squeak, squeak. There's my whole weekend gone trying to put together a bed. The middlemen, they can go out there and help our service by, hey, they deliver it and put it together so that can add value to it. Now, having all these middlemen, having all these different links to the supply chain, there's a lot of information going around. You know, the customer here talks to the, to the actual store that sells the product. The customer can also contact the manufacturer. If you get your HDTV from Sony and it doesn't work, yeah, you can complain to Best Buy or you can complain to Sony in Japan. There's all this different information flowing and these guys talk to here and then if you have the suppliers up there, there's all kind of information flowing around and we really need to make sure that we can manage that information because if we don't know, if we're Sony and we don't hear about the complaints that our customers have, well then how can we improve them? We can. That's why you want to, you know, make sure you can track the documents, track that information, and you keep all that information. And the thing is, all that information is out there, they know about you, and believe me, companies know a lot about you, they use that information, they collect it all. When they collect all of it, it's called data warehouse. It's like a big warehouse with all the data on there, all the things you've bought, when you've bought, how much you spend on it, um, you know, which units you like better. Do you like the fun size stickers or the giant size stickers? Who knows, okay? They know these things. And what you do is you have what's called data mining, where you have, imagine this big, huge cube of information, and you mine down in there to find out special things. So they'll look, and they have all this data on you, and so they'll mine down in it and say, oh, what do they find out? Ah, when he shops and he buys milk, he's usually buying baby formula as well. So he probably has a baby. Yes, we do. So what we could do is we can have offers for toddler clothes, for toddler food, because we know eventually he's going to do that. So we can tailor the coupons that come on the back of your, of your uh, receipts at a grocery store. They can tailor that for you because they have that information on you. Okay, so as supply chain people, we want to keep all the information and figure out what it says so we can see the trends that are out there, we can see buying patterns and all this kind of stuff. And it is a very hard work, but you want to keep all the information, the data warehousing stuff, and then do data mining to figure out those trends and, and buying patterns out there. Okay? Now, one of the things that really helps with the data transfer and the data warehouse and all these things is if you have an electronic data interchange. 
okay, and or an EDI. And basically what this does is all the documents you we send around in business in our supply chain, if it's computerized, you know, you have a formula, then if it's a computer's form, then I can track it. I can see the trends. I can have the menu say, is this for uh, services? Is this for, you know, product problems? What is it? We can track all these things, and therefore it gives us a way to monitor the data, analyze the data, which is awesome because then we can find things. And by having these EDIs out there, you get a lot of benefits. One thing is you reduce cycle time. The time it takes from ordering to delivery shrinks down because everything's in a standardized form. I mean, think about it. When you go to the ATM, it doesn't matter who's at the ATM. It's going to go pretty fast because there's only so many things you can do. If you go up to the, to the window and t or the, the teller, well, it could take forever because maybe you want pennies or nickels or dimes or whatever. Hey, the ATM, automation, boom, in and out. Same thing with EDIs, it makes it so there's not a lot of errors that can go into it, so things get done faster. Also, what's nice about that is it improves the quality of um, our communication because now it's all standardized, so there's no more, I can't read, was that Illinois or Indiana where it's supposed to go? Is that IL or IN? Hey, it's in the system, they have to call it, so you put IN and you put 61822, Wait, 61822 is an Illinois address. Are you sure you had the right thing? So it helps us correct those mistakes. Other things it can do for us, I mean, like I said, it puts the data set in readable form, computer form, so we can analyze it, which is very helpful out there. And sometimes when you look at your supply chain information system, because all this information is going around, sometimes you find it better that maybe inventory management is better done by somebody else. So you have vendor managed inventory, and here you want to be sharing a lot of information with them so they know when you're out of Frito Lace you know, potato chips, so they can get those free delays on their shipments and get them out to you. And, well, for companies, for retailers, something that's nice because they do all the work for you, so I don't have to hire a stock boy for the Coca-Cola aisle or a stock girl for the free delay aisle. They come do it for me. But I have to share a lot of information, and the supply chain, a lot of companies don't like to share that information out there. So you have to have a very good, tr very good trusting relationship with your supply suppliers and in your supply chain in order for these things to work. And another thing is when you have collaborative planning, forecasting, and replenishment, okay, basically you're working with your suppliers in order to figure out what is the best way to do things. And you want to plan these things out because if you call Coca-Cola today and say, I need 50,000 cans right now, they might not be able to do it. I mean, think about it. It's like pizza. If I call up Domino's right now and say, I need 100 pizzas for this party in 30 minutes less, they can't do it. But if I call them and say, hey, next week I need 100 pizzas, they can get it done because then they can arrange the supply chain, have the ovens ready, have all the pizzas ready, getting ready to pop out there, have the dominoes all over the state of Illinois making pizzas. They can get it done, okay? But we have to work together with it, all right? So I hope that gives you an idea of this, what the supply chain does and also, you know, that it's more than just the logistics. Yes, logistics go into it, but all these things kind of integrate together, how information is important there, all kinds of stuff. If you want to learn more about supply chain or marketing, please check us out at our website at www.waltersworld.com. Bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here at the Plaza in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And today we're going to talk about our, the differences between push supply chains and pull supply chains, because there are some differences that you should know, because when you're developing a supply chain, you kind of have to have an idea of when am I going to be sending the product to the next level of the supply chain? Like, when does it go to the retailers? When do I have my, you know, tires come into the factory? These kind of things. And a lot of it will depend on information, okay? Now, I'm going to start talking about what's called a pull supply chain. In a pull supply chain, orders are based on sales data. So instead of us guessing when to send stuff, it really is like when we, they check the barcodes and stuff like that, we track all this and then it shows that, oh, there's only 10 Snickers bars left. So we need to send more to the store because they're running more. And so in that sense, it really is nice for inventory management because you're basically doing that just-in-time inventory. It's coming in when we need it, okay? And so therefore, the orders are based on store-level demand. We can really track store by store. So if you're comparing a, a store that's on a campus versus a store that's in a suburb, you're going to see that, hey, there's going to be different products that are bought at different times of the day. And so by tracking that, we can see that, oh, we need to restock our liquor on Thursday afternoon for when the students get out you know, of class to go pick up stuff at the store. Whereas we need to make sure we have it ready Friday night for the suburbs because that's when people are coming home from work and they're grabbing a bottle of wine to have a nice meal, you know, a nice wine dinner with their wife or spouse or husband or whoever or their friends. And so you track that and you really do get to see this is exactly when we need to be there, okay? 
The thing is, this poll supply chain really gives us a more accurate idea of what our inventory really is because we do track everything. So if we have, you know, we know that we had 20 Snickers bars and we're tracking it shows 10 that have sold, we know that. We know there's 10 left. And so we have that. So you're going to have a lot more inventory management here. You're going to have a lot more information going around and you have to track a lot more stuff. Therefore, this means that the poll supply chain is a lot more expensive because you have to have the technology to do it. Also, you have to have the technology know-how, how to run the inventory management and stuff like that. And the thing is you do this because sometimes you're not sure what the forecast is. I don't know how much this product's gonna sell. I don't know if it's gonna be a, a popular product, so it might be better to see how sales go. And if it turns out sales are going well, we can just send more there. If it sees they're not selling, hey, we know not to order anymore. So in that respect, you know, when you don't know what the forecast is, you're not sure what the future is, that pull supply chain is a much better idea, though it is a more expensive idea. Now on the other side, you have what's called a push supply chain. And the push supply chain chain, what you're doing here is basically firms allocate their inventory based on forecasts. So it's really important that we've tracked our data for the last few years maybe to see what's our sales usually like. So you might see us, well, where are our sales last week, the week before, the week before that. And so we can forecast, oh, if we've sold 20 Snickers every week, most likely next week we're going to sell 20 Snickers. So go ahead and send us 20 Snickers bars, okay? But the thing is, you really want to have those forecasts because you might have jumps and you might have dips. Think about it. If you're looking at, you know, Halloween sales. People buy a lot of Snickers bars to give away at Halloween. We might see that, oh, it's the three weeks before Halloween. We know we usually have a big spike in sales. Hey, we're going to push more Snickers bars and more candies bars onto the stores during that time period. That's why when you go to any grocery store or any big store like Walmart, you know, in October, they have extra, extra, extra candy because of Halloween because they saw the forecast. Hey, we sold more. We don't need to worry about it. Just send us more Snickers. Okay. And the thing is this kind of supply chain stuff, this push supply chain is a lot simpler to do and a lot simpler to run. I mean, you could do it on Excel, just look at your numbers year after year. I mean, I do this for, for my Walters World Travel Channel. I look and see what months are busier. I see more people watch travel videos in March, April, May, June, July than they do August, September, October, November, December, January, February combined. You know, and it's like, it's unbelievable the difference. So I'm going to adjust the number of videos I put out at that time because I can look at the forecast. It's a very simple thing with this push supply chain. And the thing is this push supply chain is really good for products that have a steady flow, like things that don't ebb and flow. So you're going to have like milk, eggs, bread. It doesn't matter how good the economy is, how bad the economy is, what time of year it is. People are still buying bread, milk, eggs, toilet paper. Hey, you know, you still got to go no matter what's happening. And so they know they're always going to have that delivery in because they know that these things sell consistently. So we don't really need to do spend a lot of money on the really complicated supply chain technology kind of stuff. Okay. So I hope this gives you a nice little overview what the difference between a whole supply chain, remember we're supplying it when it's demanded, versus the push supply chain where we just use forecasts to kind of guess how many we should have there the next, you know, for the next shipment kind of stuff. Anyway, if you want to learn more about marketing, hit that subscribe button. We put out lots and lots and lots and lots of marketing videos, all kinds of fun stuff from all over the world and sometimes in the classroom. But I do appreciate all your likes and subscriptions and have a great day and do come to Santa Fe. It is a fantastic place and you'll eat lots of green chili sauce. It's really good, except in the morning after. Bye from Santa Fe. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Lairwick on the Shetland Islands in Northern Scotland. And today we're gonna to talk about is how products flow for businesses. Because sometimes companies wanna have what we call a direct sale, where they're selling directly to their customers. And other times we might actually use a distribution center or a retailer to get our products out there. And there's different reasons why we might do that. And if we look at a distribution center, what's helpful about using a distribution center to kind of manage your flow of products is think about it. A distribution center takes in orders from multiple retailers, right? So it's not just one store, it's 10 stores going through them. And what happens is by using that distribution center, it eliminates some of the outliers. I mean, think about it. If I'm like a liquor store, right? And if I have a liquor store and I only look at our liquor store for the college, the campus town where the college students live, well, according to that, all of our stores only want cheap beer and, and fireball whiskey, and that's it. And so we just order that for our 10 other stores. Well, the thing is, is what we do is we saw that, oh, the college
college town one orders this, but the retiree part of town orders more wine and old Milwaukee light. And the middle class part of town orders more wine. And the family part of town has more mixers. And what we do is we take all these orders together and it normalizes the orders. Also, what will happen is we also get the benefit of buying in bulk so it can reduce the prices. So we have those things out there. And for companies, by having that distribution center doing stuff, it helps eliminate some of the stock outs. So it's not like, oh, my store is out, we have nothing left. We can always call the distribution center and get more delivered to us, okay? And the thing is, I have a whole video talking about what distribution centers do, but I wanna kind of give you that idea that we're kind of putting everything together and so we're learning about everything from all of the different retailers. And the thing is, that's one of the reasons why a lot of companies might actually just do what are called direct sales, where the company sells directly to the end customer. We don't go through Walmart, we don't go through a distribution center, we just, you wanna buy the product from us, we'll bring it to you, okay? We sell it directly to you. Maybe you heard of factory direct betting? Yeah, well one of the reasons why you have factory direct betting is because do you think those furniture stores have room for the inventory of holding 50 beds or 50 queen size beds? Of course not. And so just because of the size of the product, it might demand that we actually use a direct sales method. So don't feel special that they're direct selling to you that, oh, we don't keep anything in the inventory so you get the newest, freshest bed made. No, it's because they just don't have the room for it, okay? That's why they have a show room and let 90 people lay on the same bed to test it out, okay? Also, if you want to think in more bigger scales, here, we're, we're here in the Shetland Islands and there's a lot of you know fishing vessels and stuff like that. Well, if I'm selling an aircraft carrier, do we sell aircraft carriers at Walmart? No, we sell it, we make it, then we sell it directly to the government and we deliver it to them in the harbor, right? We do that just because of the size. And so in general, we just may see that the product demands a direct sale versus using a distribution center or a retailer, okay? On the other side of things, we might actually see that some consumers demand it or, or buyers demand it or we as companies may demand it. I mean, think about it. If I have intellectual property that I don't want to lose, I don't want to give it away, I'm not going to give it to somebody else than to give it to my own customer. I'm going to be the last one that goes straight to them, okay? Because I don't want them knowing my you know nine secret herbs and spices that go into my chicken. I don't want them to know how to make my cure for cancer. I don't want them to know how to make my maglev trains. I'm going to do it on myself because I want to control the intellectual property, okay? Now, now, on the other side of things, which you might look at in terms of why you do a direct sale, it could be because you want to control every aspect of it. Think about it. A firm that prides itself on customer service and being there for their customer is going to want to be there every step of the way. So they might be there for the, the, the marketing. They might be there for the sales, for the delivery, for the installation. They want to be with you every step of the way. If I'm selling private planes, okay, I do not want to have someone else sell my planes for me. I want to show that oligarch, hey, I, you're going to buy these million dollars planes from me. We're there for you. And so we want to control the whole experience for them. So you might have that. So those are kind of the two big reasons why you do a direct sale. One, the product may demand it, or it's just because the company demands it as well. So you have that. And the thing is, is you really need to watch the video, which should be down below, on what distribution centers do for companies to help you know more about what they're going to do so you can have a better idea and so if you're dealing with a company or you're a company and trying to figure out is, should I use a retailer or do I sell direct this can help you out anyway I wish you all the best and have a great time studying if you're studying for an exam and I hope this under, like kind of explain a little bit about you know why that factory, factory direct betting isn't so special as you think it is anyway bye from the Shetland Islands Hello Marketers, Professor Walters here and today we're going to talk about how marketing channel members can really help our business do better and add value in a lot of different ways. If you think about it, all these marketing channel members, I mean these could be you know the theoretical middlemen that are out there sometimes and you'll realize that wow they really can add value to our products and services by some of the things that they offer. I mean think about it, having that marketing channel member that is near your end customer helps you out because you don't have to have a store in every single location they can do it for you so those retailers they're giving you that location so that can help you out but also those retailers they're talking to your in consumers they can work as informers for you you know not like the informers kind of stuff like informing you about hey this is what your clients are saying when they come in this is what people are deciding on when they buy the final product you can get a lot of information from them and that can help you develop better products for your customers so that adds value for you also one of the things that can really help is those 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 marketing channel members they can deliver your product 
They can install your product. I mean, hey, how many of you want to have to go out and install every single thing you sell? No. If someone else can do it for me, that's fantastic. The Maytag, we'll sell all those Maytag, you know, dishwashers and dryers and all that kind of stuff. But hey, if, if Home Depot wants to install it for us, awesome. Thank you so much. And that can add value to you, the company, but also add value to your end clients. Because think about it. Your end clients don't want to have to lug a, a, a dishwasher or a laundry machine into their house. Hey, the, the marketing channel people can help you out, which is really, really great. And the thing is, is when we look at these retailers, we look at these middlemen, we look at these, you know, uh, marketing channels, what we have to realize is they help us find and interact with our customers. That's where the informing comes in because they're interacting and talking from them. They're gathering information for us about different stuff. And we can ask them to go, hey, when people do buy our product, ask them what brought them into the store. What got them to try out this? Is it our ads? Was it social media posts? Was it word of mouth? What was it? They can help you know these things. And also they can help you by promoting your product. Obviously they can put it in the store. They can display it nicely. They can make it look better. You know, it's nice when you have the end cap there or they have the product right when you walk in like, oh, that looks like something I might want to get. Doing that can really help. And the thing is they can actually help out match up the best offers with the best customers. Because you may think, well, we want everybody to buy our biggest TV possible so we can make the most money possible. But the thing is, is maybe the biggest TV possible isn't the right product for that specific client. And therefore those marketing channel members can help line up the right clients with the right products so they're the most happy. I don't need a 70 inch TV in my office. I need a little 32 inch TV one so I can play old school video games because my kids take up the big TVs with the Xbox and Playstations. But I can have my Coleco and Nintendo Entertainment System and play it right there on that small TV and I'm good to go that's going to add value to me, the end customer. And the thing is, those, those those marketing channel members, they do take part of the risk for us because sometimes they buy the products from us and then resell it. So that's taking some of the risk. They're risking by carrying on inventory, which is one of those things you have to think about. Also, they may do the negotiations for us. So you don't get upset. I mean, think about it. When you buy a car, you always have to negotiate the final price, right? And you don't hate Ford because you had to negotiate. You hate the dealer that's doing that because Ford just has the car out there like, hey, we're Ford. We made a car. You want to go grab it? Go go buy it from one of our dealers. So the dealers are doing the negotiations work for Ford. And that makes it a lot easier for Ford because then they don't look as good or as bad or whatever, however people feel about negotiating. But it's one of those things that, hey, marketing channel members can help us out. And the thing that going along with the car is another thing that can help is our marketing channel members can actually help with financing. Because if you go to buy a car, it's not Ford necessarily that's going to give you the loan, but their financing wing or their financing officer at that Ford dealer will go and look for a good loan for you. Oh, we found one at US Bank. We found one at Citizens Bank. We found one at this bank here that would be good for you. And they do that for your end clients. So that's adding value. And that's what you have to realize. Any part of your supply chain can add value to your product or service but also it can take it away. And that's why it's really important that we're monitoring all of our marketing channels and all the people we're working with to make sure everyone's on the same page, everybody's helping add value and not taking it away. Because you wanna know if your delivery driver that's delivering your pizza shows up and their hands are all greasy and gross, you're like, oh, that's gonna make our end food not look as good. We need to know these things. And so that's why it's important that you wanna be sharing information throughout with everyone in your marketing channels and all the marketing channels so you can do the best job possible and as much value as possible because honestly your marketing channel members can really help you out to help your business succeed because you can't do it all on your own anyway i hope this helps you know a bit more of what marketing channel members can do for you and if you want to learn more well we got plenty more videos to help out and i'll say bye from here on tybee island and it looks a lot prettier if you go this way so that's nicer over there bye Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're in Indianapolis, Indiana, and today we're gonna to talk about our what distribution centers do in general for you and your business. Because Indianapolis, actually, if you look on, if you live anywhere in the Midwest, you might see your Amazon package comes through here, your FedEx passes come through Indianapolis, because it's a really big center hub for a lot of distribution places to go around the country. And so I thought it was a good place to talk about distribution centers in general. And so here we're gonna go through just kind of the basic things that they do actually do. I mean, one of the big things, obviously, they have to manage the inbound and outbound logistics of all the trucks and trains and shipments and stuff like that coming into the warehouse, coming into the distribution center and going out of it.
And so we might look at the timing when they come in because I can't have 50 trucks showing at the same time. If I only have 15 bays, I've got to make sure I have, okay, we've got 10 coming in the morning. We've got 15 in the middle of the day. We have 15 in the afternoon and some in the evening. So they kind of spread those things out, okay? Another job they have to do is they have to verify the products that actually are delivered. So there might be the RFIDs, the UPCs to actually make sure that those are there. You know, that's why they beep and check it to make sure it actually came. That's how come you can know, oh, where is my package? You can track it because they're checking on these things. Sometimes even some of the distribution centers actually go into the boxes and some of the bigger stuff to make sure that actually what was supposed to be delivered is delivered because you know some people aren't always on the up and up of stuff so that might be something else they might do. Then of course probably the most popular thing when you think of a distribution center is they actually store products, the storing of products and you'll see that you know that's why Amazon does so well because they have their distribution centers spread out all over the country, all over the world and so when you buy something it doesn't have to come from you know 20 states away or 20 countries away it might be located in your state or in a state next to yours, in a country next to yours, or a city next to yours, and they can get there a lot faster. So it actually stores products. And for for retailers, it's actually a really good thing that they store the products. Because think about it, if you're in New York on one of the fancy streets there in Chicago or in a big city where real estate is costs a lot of money per square footage, I can't every square foot that I'm using to store inventory in the back of the store is room I'm not selling stuff. So what we might do is we might have a distribution center that actually stores all of our stuff during the day and then you know in the night we say, okay, this is what we need for tomorrow. They bring it in, drop it off, and we have that because we use it as basically our inventory or our storage area. Now another thing a distribution center might do is they might actually get stuff floor ready, which doesn't happen all the time, but if you ever worked in retail, especially in clothing, if they have the clothes folded already or already on the hangers, you just take it out and hang it up in the store. That makes life so much easier, but there's different things that might mean floor ready because you might think about it. Maybe you have a pop-up shop and the pop-up shop goes and they can't have all the time dealing with the inventory. So when it shows up for the distribution center, boom, we can put it out and it's already ready to sell. Sticker prices are on there, prices tags are on there and stuff like that. So we're good to go. So obviously with all that product in the distribution center, they've got to get the products ready to ship. So they'll have the pick tickets that say, okay, these are these boxes that are going to San Antonio. These are the boxes that are going to Indianapolis. These are the ones that are going to, you know, Tokyo. They have all these things. So it's divided all up. It's all ready to go to get shipped in the right way so we can get things in better order. And that kind of goes into the what we call cross docking, which is another thing they're going to do because they might see that we have a tr uh, truck coming in from Chicago, another coming from San Antonio, another one coming in from Alberta and stuff like that. And they're all coming to our distribution center, but then they're taking off. One's going to LA, one's going to Memphis, one's going to Florida. Well, when they all come in, we want to cross dock and hey, how do I switch the stuff to go other places? How do I switch it? And so it's going to make sure that we don't have to send three trucks to LA. We only have to send one truck to LA because we cross docked and put everything on there because they're going that way. So it takes a lot of effort to get all that stuff ready. And then of course, they have to ship the products to the stores. They have to ship to the retailers and other places. And that might be also partly the logistics side of it. How, does, how do you set up the logistics? of that like what's the best path to get somewhere because you know Google Maps isn't always the best driving path but you know what we want to make sure we can find a better way to go um, maybe they have to figure out like how do we how do we move the the, the wires the have you ever wondered how they get some of the big stuff around how do they move the telephone wires the electrical wires from the streets and stuff like that when they're built, taking these things someone has to deal with that so distribution centers might be helpful in that way but a lot of times what it is is just figuring out is how do we stock or how do we pack the the trucks or how do we pack the trains so things can get in and out easier. If you want to think about it in terms of an airplane, so, you know, they're like, okay, these people are people that they, they get their bags at the location we're going to go. These are the bags that are going to need to be transferred to another plane. And so they're going to put them in different containers at the airport. So when it goes on the plane, they know that, look, these ones got to go to a different place than these ones are going to stay in Indianapolis at the airport here. So I hope that helps you know a little bit better about what distribution centers do, just to give you a few of the things. I mean, they do other things as well. And some distribution centers are just for storage and some ones are just for cross docking. So you kind of want to just kind of have that in mind. But I thought I'd give you an idea of what they do here in a big distribution center in the U.S. in Indianapolis. Indianapolis with a ton of them here to kind of you'll see on your, your Amazon tickets and stuff like that. Anyway, I wish you all the best and I'll say bye from here in Indianapolis. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here and today I am in El Salvador on the beach with my family and this actually kind of goes into today's topic and the topic is supply chain conflict because when you're working with a big group, okay, when you have your logistics people, you got your pricing people, you got your finance, you got your delivery people, you got your suppliers, you have all these things, you most likely will have some conflict that does arise, okay? Think about it when you're trying to choose a vacation, doesn't conflict usually arise because one person wants to hit the beach, one person wants to go to the pool, 
pool, one person wants to go fishing, one person just wants to sit and drink at the bar. You have all these kind of different kind of conflicts that can arise. And the same thing happens in business, okay? Because in order for our supply chain to work more effectively and efficiently, we need to make sure we know where potential supply chain conflict may arise so we can deal with it before it happens or deal with it while it's happening, okay? Now, I do have another video we filmed, I think in Rwanda, that's actually about kind of fixing all this supply chain conflict afterwards. This one, we're just focused on where these supply chain conflicts really do arise. And a lot of it really comes down to a few things. One, people have different goals, people have different roles, and people have different rewards in the supply chain. So if you think about it in terms of goals, okay, each of us have a different goal that we're trying to do. So for example, the delivery person's trying to deliver it as fast as possible. And you know, that's why you'll see, you know, sometimes you look online and you'll see the delivery drivers just throw the boxes at somebody's house. Now not really caring, just throwing over the fence, not ringing the doorbell. Hey, look, I'm just trying to get there as fast as possible. Whereas that company that had it shipped, they want their product in the best shape possible. And if it gets thrown over a fence, that could mess things up, right? And so we don't want to do that. So we have a little conflict there. So if you think about it, you as a student, maybe you have different goals in terms of your group projects. Because think about it, you want to finish with a 4.0 in your, in your exams, right? You want to get a 4.0 in your grade, your GPA overall, and you're in a group project with a senior that already has a job that doesn't care. They're like, D's get degrees, yeah. And don't you can see some conflict there? Yes, because we have different goals. I want an A, you just want to pass. So that can be a thing there we have to worry about. Now, also the roles we have within the company, that's that delivery driver versus the person that wants to quality control that the product's not broken. There could be some conflict there because their whole system is different. Their whole role in the business is different, okay? But also we could look at it in terms of rewards, how you're paid, that can actually get supply chain conflict as well. Because think about it, if you're on a salaried pay, you get paid no matter if you're there for 10 hours or two hours, you're gonna to wanna to get as much work done as possible and get out of there. But what if you're working with somebody that's getting paid hourly? No, I wanna be there for 10 hours. I wanna take all the time I can to fill up my timesheet so then I get a full 10 hour workday. Not finishing in two hours, because now I'm losing eight hours of pay. And can you see how some conflict happens right there and you do see it a lot of times now in terms of specifically naming types of supply chain conflict there's vertical supply chain conflict so this would be you know the the pizza delivery place right you order pizza that pizza store the pizzeria they want to get you that pizza hot fresh ready right away okay so their goal is to get you that pizza hot and fresh and ready but the driver do they really want to get a ticket i mean do i want a 75 dollar ticket for delivering a $10 pizza? Probably not, right? So we might have some conflict there vertically because think about it. That delivery driver is the logistics, the outbound logistics of the company that's making the pizza. You know, you have those things. Now on the other side of it, you might have what's called horizontal supply chain conflict. This is when you have problems at the same level of the business. So this is, let's say it's a chain like a Papa John's or a Domino's or something like that. And they're all over town, right? So there's multiple Domino's you can call, there's multiple Papa John's you could call, right? So in Domino's, you know, they might have it that, hey, you know, this one Domino store, they only serve this part of town. Have you ever called a pizzeria and like, oh, we don't deliver there. You got to talk to our Chalmers street store, okay? Or like, oh, okay. And so you call them and order from them. Well, where supply chain conflicts had come about, this actually happened to me um, when I first moved to where I'm teaching now. And I, I actually called up Papa John's. I'm like, am I at work? I called the number that was from where, I, you know, I called the number for Papa John's. It's like, hi, yeah, I want to order a pizza for delivery. And I gave my address and stuff like that at home, you know, and they're like, oh, we don't deliver there. You got to talk this other, this other one. I'm like, oh, okay, that's fine. He's, but the, the, the person on the other line says, but wait, you know, if you want, if you're working on campus, you can order pickup from us and then you can pick it up on your way out of town so it's right there. Now, I'm sure they just were trying to help me out, but can you see how that could be a little bit of a conflict because that other pe Papa John's would have got my money, but now they're not. And so you have that kind of like tension there, like, wait, you're stealing my business. And so that's why you have companies that try to avoid this horizontal supply chain conflict. They'll have regions, okay? Like you're the Illinois region, you're the Missouri region, you're the El Salvador region. It's just so you don't have that kind of conflict because there really is a lot of conflict that can come about in our supply chains. And so I just want to give you an idea of some of the places where those kind of issues do pop up, okay? So whether you're going on a family vacation where someone wants the beach, another person just wants to go someplace where they're not sweating, 
it does happen, you wanna find ways to get around that. So go watch our other video about overcoming supply chain conflict to help out. So I'll say bye from here in beautiful, wonderful El Salvador. Adios. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Rwanda. We're actually just outside the Volcano National Park. Sadly, you cannot see any of the volcanoes behind me because, well, it's all cloudy now, it's the afternoon, but it is gorgeous here. And we've been really traveling around, seeing so many really cool things here in Rwanda, and I really noticed how supply chains are really working really well here for tourism, because the supply chain of the hotels, with the tour guides, with the sites you see, with the gorillas and thing, treks you can do, it all really works together really well. And like, this is great and I see what they've done is they've really overcome a lot of the obstacles and troubles that supply chains have so I thought I'd make a video today on how we can reduce supply chain conflict in our own supply chains and what's funny is when you think about supply chains and how to reduce those conflicts it's actually pretty similar to relationships because think about it in a supply chain you're working with somebody quite often right they're supplying you the food for your restaurant or they're supplying you the computer chips for the computers you make well in relationships what are they supplying to you they're supplying the friendship to you they're supplying the trust to you there's all these kind of things very similar to it but also supply chains well they have issues right sometimes they get into fights over prices well don't we get into fights with our friends sometimes like I don't like that movie and you like that movie I want pepperoni pizza and you want avocado pizza we have disagreements okay so what I want to talk about are five ways that we can really cut down on these kind of disagreements in our supply chain to help things work out better, okay? And the first thing you need to have is open communication. Look, in any relationship, whether it's professional or personal, open communication is key. I mean, think about it. If your boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse or partner all of a sudden isn't talking to you, you know there's a problem. And if you haven't realized that yet, there is definitely a problem, okay? And in supply chain, it's the same thing. We need to have that open flow of communication. We need to know, hey, what's the sales data? Hey, what are your customers saying so we can make sure we're doing the right stuff? We need to be sharing all this information back and forth. So we need to make sure we develop really clear, easy ways for everyone in our supply chain to talk to each other, okay? Whether it is you're making sure everyone's on the same data plan or someone, everybody's working on the same, you know, document sharing files and stuff like that. We want to make sure it's all okay so information gets shared because the last thing we want is for us not to be able to communicate with each other. And as we communicate more, it kind of leads into the second issue we need to look at, and that is when we build mutual trust. I mean, think about it. I trust my friend to have a good time, right? And that's why I always go with my same friends because we have a good time together every single time. Well, for supply chains, hey, I need to make sure I can trust that I'm gonna have a good time with my suppliers or my you know, people I'm selling to on the supply chain. And the thing is, what's a good time for a business? Hey, our business is running well. We're making money. We're making a profit. And that's why in order to get that open communication, if we develop that mutual trust, it's a lot more likely that we're going to share information with our suppliers, right? And they're going to share information with us. It's like your friends. The more you develop a friendship, the more secrets you share with them, the more things that really matter to you. I mean, think about it. When you first met your best friend, did you share your deepest, darkest secrets with them the first day? No, of course not. It took time to develop that mutual trust. And it's the same thing in supply chain we have to consistently deliver on this relationship hey we're de we're delivering our products on time we're giving you a good fair price we're doing all this we're both being successful these things together build that mutual trust and then we start sharing more and more information now the third thing that can kind of decrease supply chain conflict is if we have common goals if everybody in the supply chain is going for the same goal it makes it a lot easier because we're all running the same way okay that's what's really great and so what you'll see is if you don't have people with the same goals that's where the conflict arises if you're a student and you're in a group project right we've all had a group project right and you want to get an A of course but then you got that other student that's like hey remember D's get degrees and you're like oh I don't want to ruin my GPA because you're lazy well those different goals that's gonna cause conflict so we want to kind of make sure that we're aligning our goals so we have common goals that will definitely help us reduce our supply chain conflict okay and that's why one of the good examples you see here in Rwanda is actually the mountain gorillas are here like up in there there's mountain gorillas you can go trekking with them and the gorillas will go from Rwanda to Uganda to Congo and they'll go you know they'll go around and the thing is the common goal of all those three countries is to keep the gorillas going help support the communities of the gorillas because there's a lot of tourism money that comes in here so that common goal hey we want to make sure the tourism dollars keep coming we know the gorillas are really important so we're going to work 
together. And so that really helps eliminate a lot of the conflict in the supply chain kind of stuff in terms of fighting poachers here. And that's what's funny is because you'll see the governments might not always get along with the countries. But here, when it comes to helping the gorillas, they do because we all have this same goal. Keep the tourism coming and keep those gorillas safe because that brings in a lot of people and creates a lot of jobs here. And that leads us into the fourth thing that really helps, you know, eliminate a lot of the supply chain conflict is if we have what's called interdependence. If my success is dependent on your success, I'm going to make sure you don't fail because I'm not going to fail because then we're both going to go down. That's why you're like, hey, let's just work together in these things. Again, going to the anti-poaching stuff you see here in Rwanda and Uganda and stuff like that, Demo Democratic Republic of Congo, is they're all working together. Look, if Uganda doesn't help fight the poachers, well, that's not, it, Rwanda will fail. If Rwanda doesn't help, then Uganda will fail. So we're all in, in this together, right? And that's going to help us really fight the conflict because, hey, look, we're arm in arm here. We're working together for the same goal. Remember, these things all kind of like come together. You can see how these things kind of really link together to help to eliminate conflict. So if we're interdependent, we have our success is dependent on each other, then of course, it's going to help us eliminate a lot of stuff. And then we have the fifth thing I want to talk about, and that is credible commitments. Look, if you want to reduce supply chain conflict, it's just like in a relationship. You got to show some commitment. Hey, you really want to prove that you really like the girl? Put a ring on that finger, right? Hey, I want to, I, I really care about you. Well, then you need to call her girlfriend or you need to call him boyfriend or partner or whatever. Cause you're just like, oh yeah, she's a friend of mine. Uh, that's not the same thing as a girlfriend. That's not the same thing as saying he's my friend versus he's my boyfriend. You have to think about these things. We need some kind of credible commitment that shows that, look, we really care about this supply chain. We really want to work together. That's why, you know, you put the ring on it. Yeah, exactly. There's that there. In terms of a business sense, have you ever been driving down the highway and you see the McDonald's trucks going by and there's a Big Mac and there's a French fry there and what's next to it? An ice cold Coca-Cola. McDonald's is showing their commitment to Coca-Cola by putting Coca-Cola on the sides of all their trucks. And that's one of those ways you can really show that commitment is like, look, I'm proving it. I got your, I got your product on my product. Okay. So you have that. So I hope this helps you understand some of the ways that you can reduce supply chain conflict and maybe reduce a little conflict in your own lives as well. If you're having some personal issues out there. Anyway, I hope this helps you to learn a little bit more. If you do want to learn more, hit that subscribe button. We put out new business videos every week, marketing, YouTube, all kinds of stuff to help people learn and grow. And if this helps you on your journey to a better grade on an exam, Hey, good luck on your exam. This helps you on your journey to being a better entrepreneur. I hope it helps as well. And if you have supply chain conflict, or you saw other issues now you got over it put in the comment section below so other people can learn how to kind of overcome some of the conflicts we do have in our supply chains or our relationships whichever you prefer anyway i'll say bye from here in Rwanda. if you're wondering about coming here this country is fantastic sparkling clean streets people are super nice the gorillas are amazing and there's this there's, there's the country of a thousand hills and believe me there's a lot of hills to go through so if you're going to be driving watch your tummy because it's a little tummy shaky all right. Anyway, I'll see you later. Bye from Rwanda. Hey there, fellow marketers. Professor Walters here. And today we're going to talk about our vertical supply chain. So I've got kind of a vertical supply chain here because you got the suppliers, the manufacturer, the wholesaler, the retailer, these kind of things. It kind of goes in a vertical way. So you see how to kind of like supplies, products, manufacturing kind of flow through the supply chain. And the thing is, is, well, one, there, there's m multiple ways you can make supply chains. Okay. This is just a simple example. But the thing is, is, when we look at vertical supply chains, what we have to realize is there's a lot of different kind of ways you could have your vertical supply chain, a lot of different types of supply chains. And it really comes down sometimes to ownership or control that supply chain. How much control do I want to have? How much influence do I want to have? These kind of things. Because if you think about it, if you have what's called an independent supply chain, each one of these suppliers, each one of these parts of the supply chain are going to be independent. So each one is going to be looking out for themselves because they don't care about this person. They don't care about this person or this person. They only care about themselves. So I got to make sure I'm doing the best for me as a supplier. Right. And so you can have you can see how this could cause some kind of conflict. And honestly, when you have independent supply chains, that's a lot of times when you do have conflict because each person, each level of the supply chain is looking out for themselves. And the thing is, is we don't want to have to go every single time to find a new wholesaler or a new retailer for each time we're trying to sell a product or deliver stuff. Or if I'm a wholesaler, like the, the logistics side of it, I don't have to deal with this every single time trying to figure somebody else out and looking behind my back. 
So what happens is a lot of times people set up what are called contractual vertical supply chains. So here, everybody is like signing contracts to agree to work with each other. So I'm not worried that one time the wholesaler is going to charge me $10, the next time it's $20, the next time it's $15. No, we're going to have a contract where I'm going to agree on these things so we can work together. And in this way, the independent firms actually sign contracts to work together. And you'll see this a lot of time in franchising because look, we're all going to agree. I'm going to make sure I get the same meat from the same factory or the same farm. I'm going to make sure all these things kind of line up and have the, everybody's going to be using the same trucks to deliver. They, though, you know, McDonald's might not own all their own trucks, but they're going to sign a contract with a trucking company that's going to make sure they're delivering their stuff. And they're going to put their McDonald's labels on the side. So you see that Big Mac going down the highway. They're going to do those things. Okay. So you have that. And the thing is, is when you have these kind of control contractual vertical supply chains, sometimes what you're going to see is an administered vertical supply chain. And this is when one company kind of dominates the entire thing. I mean, think about it. If you're working with Walmart, I mean, Walmart's going to pretty much dominate the entire supply chain when it comes to that industry, right? Or it can, comes to that supply chain. And so you might see that, yes, we have all these independent companies, but since one, the retailer Walmart here is so much more powerful, they can kind of dictate, hey, look, this is, this is what we're going to be paying. So the manufacturer has to work with the suppliers to make sure that everything relates to what Walmart wants. You might see those kind of things like that. Now, another thing you might see is what's called a corporate vertical marketing system. And this is when one company owns every single level of the supply chain. Why would you do that? Well, if I want to control all of the inputs. If I want to control the distribution, I want to control everything, then I might go that way because maybe I have intellectual property I don't want to lose control of, right? So I'm like, hey, look, I'm not sure how this is going to go. I want to make sure I'm controlling it. Now, the thing is, that makes it a lot more expensive for the company if they own every part. But if it's important to them that they do control things and they do control like mess ups and things like that, that could be something they look at. Because if you think about it, if we're looking at contractual vertical supply chains, that might be kind of like your Uber Eats where, yeah, we'll sign a contract with Uber Eats that they'll be the exclusive deliverer of McDonald's or Hardee's or whatever, right? And so McDonald's has that, you know, oh, hey, look, we have this contract. They're going to ship it out with Uber Eats. People can come pick it up and they'll drive it to your house, whatever. Great. But what if you're a restaurant that's like, look, I can't take the chance that people get their food delivered late because, you know, your Uber Eats driver might be dropping off three or four different bags. You know, and if they do, well, will one be cold and you're worried and, and you know, there, there are rumors that sometimes, I'm not saying Uber Eats drivers do this, but there's, there's rumors out there that some drivers for some of these places have been known to admit that they might sneak a fry here or there. Hey, do we want to worry about that? So what you might see is companies take it upon themselves that, look, I'm going to have more of a corporate verticals marketing system where we're going to have our own delivery drivers. We're going to own the farms. We're going to have all this kind of stuff that ships it into us. So we're controlling it every place. That's why I know there's like the Panera Bread Company, right? Like they have their own drivers. I'm like, why wouldn't you just use like Uber Eats or something like that? And I think that, look, they're like, look, we're a higher quality product. We want to make sure that everything's okay. We want to have our own drivers that will represent Panera and not just, you know, drop off food. Because think about it. Think about where these, you know, conflicts can arise. Because if one part of the supply chain is out of my control, it do, if I'm the one that's noticed about it, if I'm the one people focus on, they won't be mad at Uber Eats or, or whatever delivery system it is. They'll be mad at my restaurant, right? And so that's why you might see companies doing this kind of corporate vertical marketing system. So it's kind of interesting when you see that, look, how, how are we going to have this relationship? Is there something that's more powerful than somebody else? Does someone, one company own it all? Or is it just individual groups and individual companies just making contracts to work together? So, we, hey, look, we know we're going to deliver with each other for a couple of years, so I'm not going to screw you over. You're not going to screw me over because we got a contract because we're going to deliver what it says here and you're going to pay us what it says there. So I hope this helps you understand like the vertical supply chains and the different ones that are out there. Um, if you want to learn more, we do have more videos at ProfessorWalters.com. Bye. Hi guys, Mark here with Walters World and we're outside the San Xavier Mission in Tucson, Arizona, or just outside of Tucson, Arizona. And today we're going to talk about uh, is a value chain analysis. This is when you take a firm and you break it up into all the different parts, you know, your manufacturing, your, your, your procurement, your management, all these different sections. You break up all the activities that your company does and you realize that each activity you do can add or take away value from your company. Now this is a very good analytical tool in terms of finding a place where you can find some
competitive advantage or find areas where you can improve because think oh, oh we're perfect just the way we are no you can always find different places to improve and that's what you do a value chain analysis for now basically what happens in a value chain analysis you divide up the, the the different activities you do you have what are called primary activities these are activities that you use in order to make the product you know you're getting your you're, you're getting your, your your supplies you're making your product you're selling your product there's all these kind of things the main part you hear about that is inbound logistics so okay I'm getting my supplies to me operations which is actually making your products so we're putting our car together or whatever you have outbound logistics you know delivery of your products you know like Domino's that's what they did their outbound logistics they became famous they got really good at that the pizza wasn't very good but they get it to you 30 minutes and less so they use that as their, their thing there you have your marketing and sales so if you have a good sales staff marketing team they can help sell things and then you have your service or aftercare service these kind of things all these kind of go into actually buying and selling the products making the products that people identify with because when you go buy a car you don't think you think of the manufacturers in Detroit and the car salesmen in Jacksonville Illinois you think of these guys you don't think of the manager you don't think of the accountant these kind of things and these things you don't think about these are the secondary activities okay these are things in the background the firm infrastructure um, basically, you know, how is the office set up? Um, how is your procurement? Who's the one founding the paper? How about human resources? Think about it. If you have a good human resource department, no, you, they don't actually make the cars, but they can find the right people to make them to make better cars. Okay. Also in there, you have your management team, you have your IT department, all that stuff in there, your accounting, your legal. There's all kinds of things, that activities that go on behind the scenes that can add value to your firm. Because you have a good management, hey, you can go a lot farther. It's kind of like if you look at basketball, football teams, things like that. If they have a good manager, they can get the most out of not the best players. Because you know what? The best team doesn't always win. It's the best one that works together. So having that good management team can help out. Okay? So when you have these different activities, okay, you see, okay, how are we doing? How do we compare? to everyone else because you could benchmark yourself against them but you may say hey how are we going to help ourselves out so if you look at some examples like I told you you know you had Domino's Pizza they focus on their outbound logistics they develop that so it could be 30 minutes or less so what are all the strategies that went into that okay we gotta make our pizzas can be that that fast we gotta have our locations to go in there we gotta have our delivery drivers know the area there's all these kind of strategies that go into it to improving that kind of thing if you look at Nordstrom their whole thing is their marketing and sales and service okay so whatever you have any problems we're all they're always gonna help you out they're always gonna make everything better and that helps out they add value there so you want to pay more for it okay and you see these things each one of these little things can add value and make customers want to pay more for it because they put more value into it so I hope that gives you a rough idea of how what a value chain analysis is and how you can use it to improve your company if you have any questions about it please leave a comment below I love answering them um, if you have any other questions about marketing or business strategy or all kinds of stuff or you want to learn more about this mission here in Tucson Arizona check us out on our website at www.waltersworld.com and please like and favorite this video and we really appreciate all your subscriptions bye from San Xavier Mission outside of Tucson Arizona Hey fellow marketers, Professor Vultures here, and today is the day we go through marketing math. No, it's not anyone's favorite day when it comes to marketing class, but there are some ratios and some numbers that you should know how to calculate in order to understand how things are going for your company. Like how much money do we need to make to stay in business and how many units do we need to sell or or maybe we have to figure out is which brand is growing better than the other ones and how are we doing to our competition? What's our market share? These kind of questions are things that you're going to have to answer as a marketer. So I thought it'd be a good idea for us to go through some of these basic math things. And a few of the first ones are really going back to, you know, Econ 101 kind of stuff. All right. And so if you're looking at your total cost, you know, what is it going to cost us to be in business? To get your total cost, that equals your fixed cost plus your variable costs. OK, so the fixed cost, like we have to pay our mortgage plus the variable costs, like how much do we have to pay, spend to make each product? you're putting those together to figure out your total costs. And of course, with that, you wanna figure out is, are we making any money? And if you wanna figure out if you're making a profit or a loss, it's, it's pretty straightforward. What you're doing is you look at your total revenue and you subtract your total cost. And if it's positive, congratulations, you have a profit. If it's uh, negative, yeah, I'm sorry, but you've got a loss, so we need to do something about that. So the next thing you want to look at is what we call the unit contribution, which is basically the price minus the variable cost. And what this gives you is an idea of how much the sale is actually going towards either the profit or overall lost. Okay, so you're seeing what it's contributing, like each unit sale, 
what is it contributing to in the end, okay? Towards the profits or towards the loss. And that leads into our contribution margin, okay? We're looking for this ratio that shows how much each sale contributes to the profit or the total cost, basically, relative to its actual price, okay? And so for that, what you end up having is, on the top, again, we have unit price, minus unit variable cost over the unit price, okay? So that gives you kind of an idea there. Now, another thing you might look at is what we call a markup, okay? So the markup is unit price, okay, this is on the top, unit price minus unit variable cost over that unit variable cost. And this basically shows how the sale contributes to profit or loss in relation to the variable cost of actually making that individual product, okay? Now the next thing I want to look at is what we call the break-even volume, because we have to know is how many units do I need to sell in order for us to, you know, like break even, right? The break even volume seems pretty straightforward. And so what we're looking at here is we're just trying to figure out the break even. So we're not trying to make any money. This is making zero profits, okay? We're just trying to figure out how many units, so I'm at zero. I don't have to pay anybody anything else. Okay, so we're just covering our costs. And to figure out this break even volume, what you do is you have the fixed costs on top, and then underneath you have the overall unit cost minus the variable cost that's in there. And that gives you an idea of the volume you're gonna have to kind of put out. Now the thing is, is some people maybe don't look at the volume. Sometimes they do what's called a break even, you know, sales number. And so the break even sales, what that equals is on top, you have the fixed cost again, and then underneath is that contribution margin. And that gives you an idea of the total sales you would need at a certain price that will produce zero profit, right? So you have an idea of how many sales we have to have, so we're breaking even. And what's nice with this, it actually helps make sure we're covering all those associated costs with, you know, breaking even. Now let's say we want to look at how each one of our brands are doing. Because you might have a lot of different brands you're dealing with, a lot of different products you're trying to sell in, and you're trying to figure out, it's like, hey, what's our brand growth rate? Okay, how big is this brand growing? And so to figure out your brand growth rate, what you're going to need to do is you're going to have sales from today, okay, and then you subtract it from, you know, one time period ago. So you'll probably see sales T minus sales T minus one, you know, in the subscript there. You have that, and you take that over sales, in T minus one period, okay? So it's showing you how are things changing. Is it growing or is it getting smaller? So if it's a positive number, hey, we do have some kind of growth there. If it's a negative number, uh-oh, our brand growth rate is actually going down. We have a problem here. Now another thing we're gonna look at is what's called market share, okay? Our market share is percentage. And what you're gonna do here is you're gonna look at your brand sales. Now the thing is, it could be the money spent or it could be a units move, things like that. That's up to you to decide, okay? But you have to be consistent, you know, throughout the formula. But it's the brand sales over the category sales, okay? So basically, how much money did we make or how much money did we sell in sales versus how much was sale in the entire market or how many units we sold versus the total number of units sold in that industry or in that market we're looking at, okay? And that gives us our market share. So that really gives us an idea of a firm success in the marketplace or basically how well we're doing compared to the market oh we have a 20 percent market share 30 percent market share we're at one percent market share okay we have room to grow that gives you that kind of idea and the thing is market share overall could be kind of misleading so sometimes what you want to do is kind of figure out your relative market share especially if you're looking at your competition and here what you look at is our market share that we calculate over our competitors market share and so that gives an idea of how well are we doing versus our competition? Because we really don't want to always compare ourselves to the entire market. Sometimes it's just comparing ourselves to like our direct competition, okay? Now, the next one I want to talk about is our return on investment. This is a pretty standard one that's out there. And that's just your net profit over your total investment in whatever investment area you're looking at. And then if you look at our return on marketing investment, what we're going to have here is on the top, you have your gross profit minus your marketing expenses and then on the bottom, you have your marketing expenses there. And that gives you an idea of how much money do we make off of the marketing expenses that we did have. So you have kind of like a numerical number to show like the payoff for our marketing. Now I know math is not the highlight of this class and that's why we just have one or two videos on math marketing or marketing math here. And as you can tell, not my strong suit in teaching either, but it's things you should know because these are numbers you need to put out to your bosses and stuff like to show them like, look, this is what we've done. This is what we're contributing. This is why this product will be good. Here's our true market leader because we have the biggest market share in our market here. Use all these in different ways, okay? So I hope this helps you know a little bit more and uh, good luck with the rest of these marketing videos. Don't worry, very little math after this. 
Hey fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in the forests of Idaho, and today we're going to talk about some of the trends we find in retail these days. And I know some of you are asking yourself, Mark, I'm failing to see the connection between a forest in Idaho and retail. Well, honestly, people, retail is everywhere. It's here in the middle of a forest in Idaho or it's on Main Street America. And what you have to realize is there's been some changes going on in these trends that companies need to take advantage of because some people, hey, you know what? We're not going to the store. We're staying at home in a cabin and just enjoying it here. And that's one of the things you have to look at is really the, the continual growth of online shopping, mobile shopping, you know, shopping with your phone, all kinds of things like that. And the thing is companies are really pushing this now, you know, with with the coronavirus pandemic having made a lot of businesses finally realize they have to go all in online or they're going to go out of business, this is really influencing retailers. So they have to have a well-run website. Their social media needs to be on point. Maybe they have apps to buy their products or their services so you could enjoy that. And we start to see it's like, yeah, this is what we're starting to do. Look at yourself. How many of you still go out and buy DVDs? You don't. The retail of movies making now is the streaming services. I got to get the Disney Plus or, so, or my Netflix or Hulu or whatever. And so we start seeing those things. So the big trend of going online is going to keep going and it's going to get more and more. And it's not just going to be Amazon. Now companies are starting to take advantage of the situation saying, hey, you know what? We can develop our own stuff and we don't have to go through Amazon. Because let's be honest, Amazon doesn't always have the best deal. And if you have all these extra, have you ever noticed a lot of the retailers now have all those loyalty programs? Get free shipping, get free stuff, get, you know, you know, for every 10 pizza, get 11th one free. They're doing that so you use their website, their retail through them versus somebody else. So that's one trend that we're going to see continue. You know, and it's, it started, but it keeps going. The next thing you're going to see, and another trend that's been going for a while, is the thrifty retailer, okay? Or the thrifty consumer, I should say. And here you're seeing people that are, that are realizing, look, I don't have to buy everything at the expensive grocery store. I can go to Aldi for some stuff. I can go to Walmart for some things because why should I pay four bucks for milk when I can pay two bucks for milk that probably came from the same cow? And the thing is, is as economic times get tougher, those thrifty shoppers, you know, the, the income level may be higher, but they're still being more thrifty with their money. And this is one of the things that could continue on. And for thrifty base retailers like Walmart, like Aldi, they can take advantage of this. They can see that they can show customers, look, come shop with us. Yeah, we have lower prices, but our products are still good. And so then when people have the income again, or maybe the recession's over or you know, whatever, they're like, you know what? Why should I go back to Target to buy my groceries? Or why should I go to that fancy grocery store like Albertsons or Schnucks when I can get it all at Walmart at a discount? And that's why companies need to realize is these thrifty shoppers, they're, they're not going away. Okay, so we need to factor them in. Hence why you're seeing Armani has Emporio Armani, right? You have these lower, you know, priced products that will fit into that more thrifty consumer. Now, another thing you see is the kind of what we call the ever-changing face of retail. I remember back when you were a kid, it was like, yay, let's go to the mall. And you do all your shopping there, right? And then the big box stores kind of took over and you do the box store stuff. And then you maybe go with your friends to the mall or something like that. And what we've seen is the malls have changed. Now you have those pop-up shops that might be there, or they might have a pop-up shop in a, a parking lot, right? To put things there. Or how about this? temporary shopping locations. How many of you go to Halloween Spirit for your Halloween gear? It's only there September and, and October, right? Then like November 1st, poof, it's gone. You're like, wait, where'd it go? And you're like, wait, well, Halloween Spirit turned into Christmas land for two months for November and December? We're starting to see that these retailers are gonna be very different. They have to take advantage of this. That's why you see these malls that have these anchor stores like Sears, right? Or, or JCPenney's or Macy's that have had tough financial times or maybe they've gone out of business. They have these big stores spaces that are empty. And so they're trying to refigure how do we use this retail space? What do we do with it? Heck, in my hometown, you know what they did? The Bergners that went out of business, they turned it into a doctor's office. Yes, it is a big doctor's office for like cancer treatment or something like that, right? You're like, whoa, that's interesting. We got to figure things out. Have you noticed a lot of malls have started to put you know, gyms on the end of it, why? Well, if we put a gym on there, people theoretically go to the gym a lot of days a week, right? So they come to the gym, they might walk through the mall as well. They might pick something up. So they're bringing that traffic in because in general, people aren't just browsing the mall to shop. 
we're browsing online to shop. And so retailers need to adjust to that. Now, another thing I think is important, and this is one thing that a lot of retailers have started to do is what we call green retailing. And here's where companies are really starting to focus more on the sustainable side of business. You know, they're trying to figure out how can we make our products less, you know, using less packaging? How can we use it to me, you know, using less weight or having less waste or, or using less electricity? What, what can we do to help out? And so that's why you'll see some countries and some states and some cities, you might have to pay for your bag or some places they'll encourage consumers, hey, bring your own bag and we'll, we'll give you a discount, right? Or, hey, you know what? We're not doing too much packaging here. So instead of having the old CD long boxes, for those who don't know back, CDs used to come in boxes this long, they just give you like the CD itself or just download it and save yourself that garbage that, that what might be in a landfill one day when you can just digitally download it. You're seeing more of the sustainability in retail as well. Now, another thing that I see, and I know my students do this a lot, is what we call showrooming. And showrooming is when people will go into a store to look at a product, test a product out, and then buy it online. I mean, let's be honest. How many of you go to Best Buy to try out a computer and then you look online? Who's got the best deal? Does Amazon has it? Does Dell Direct have it? Does eBay have it? And then you buy it there. And so retailers need to realize that, hey, customers are coming to our store just to test out our products and buy it somewhere else. What can we do to combat that? Well, one thing you'll see if you go to Best Buy, they have their little like phones right there. Oh, we can check and see what other prices are. Or maybe they'll see price match guarantees places, right? So they're like, look, you can test out here and we'll match the prices online so you can just buy it here. They can do that, okay? Because they're trying to take, you know, try to fight off some of the problems of showrooming. But on the other side, companies can do a really good job of showrooming to do business. For example, what if Amazon bought all those old Sears stores, right? And in all those Sears stores, they just had like, here's our 100 most popular products, and they just have it there. So you go around, you can look at it, test it out, see what it is. And okay, I'll buy that. You know, you get your Amazon app, boom, buy it there. They deliver it to your house the next day or the same day, depending where you are. These are things companies have to really think Think about in terms of taking advantage of that showrooming that's happening in retail because we got to make sure we're getting the customers actually buy from us but also we want to inspire people to buy so you have to think about that and the last trend i want to talk about and there's more trends out there but the last one i want to talk about is this kind of non-touch retailing okay curbside delivery right or delivered to your house or or no contact pizza delivery right you see these things and, and so we're seeing this more and more because whether it's with a pandemic that happened or, or people just you know like liking less and less to be with other people we have to figure out ways that we can actually help our customers shop maybe without actually being in contact with them. What can we do to make it easier for them? Maybe it is, you know what, what what's your shoe size? We'll send, well, here's some pictures of shoes. We'll send them to you. You can just send them back to us, okay? So we're not really touching each other. We're not interacting with each other. Or maybe you just have it, you know, the curbside pickup for, you see a lot of times with restaurants where some businesses have that, you can call it up and they'll do that. I know my parents, what they do is they put their order form in for their groceries and they give them a time and they drive up, they pop the trunk, they put the, the people at the grocery store, put it all in the back of the car, they shut the thing, buy, they wave it, non-touch, right? And so we're seeing these things happen and so retailers need to take advantage of that or at least need to be like aware of these trends that are out there. And there's lots of other trends, like I said, but these are ones I think is that are really important for retailers to really consider when they're thinking of like, how am I gonna survive all this? What do I need to do to be ready for the future? These are the things you should really think about. Anyway, I hope this helps you know a bit more of some of the trends that are going on in retail. If you want to learn more, click that subscribe button. We put all kinds of business videos out every week. Bye from here in beautiful Idaho. Hi guys, Mark here with Walters World and today what we're going to talk about is the supply chain and how information in the supply chain can flow and how we can manage it as a firm. Now, if you look at the supply chain in general, if you're a marketing student, remember those four P's of marketing, price, product, place, and promotion? Well, place, this is where the supply chain comes in. Trying to figure out what, basically deal with all the different ways that we have to deliver the value of our product, okay? Now, usually when people think about the supply chain, all they think about is the logistics side of things. Getting our product from the manufacturer to a distribution center, or getting our product from the manufacturer to the end customer or the retailer, whatever you want to look at. Guys, it's a lot more than that. Supply chain is not just logistics. Logistics does go into it, but supply chain is managing all the relationships with the manufacturers, with the suppliers that are up here above us, 
with the distribution center, with retailers, customers, all these things in there. And that's why information management is one of the key aspects of working in the supply chain. Okay, but overall, the supply chain is all of the things we do to have an efficient and effective system of producing our products, procuring our products, getting it through the whole system, the whole supply chain, from the pig farm in Podunk, town, wherever, to our plate in our homes. So basically, it's integrating every step from concept to sales in the business in order to help the company make more money. That's supply chain management. Now, supply chain can help us. It can help us by streamlining distribution. Some of the things they can help us with is, you know, getting our orders filled out faster, um, eliminating inefficiencies that are out there, all kinds of stuff like helping with reducing shipping errors. So there's, there's redu having good supply chain management helps reduce some problems. Therefore, less problems less cost, less waste. Also, supply chain does come into effect in marketing, because if you think about it, if we're thinking about making, okay, we want to come up with a new product, well, supply chain helps us find those suppliers. If we're going to make a new laptop, they help us find the right processors that are going to work on our tablets or a laptop or whatever. Also, the supply chain, what they do is they help us figure out what the best distribution network is or distribution way of distribution channel for our new product. Do we want to go straight to the customer or would it be best to go to uh, a, a retail store or somewhere else in between? So they help with those things too. And also, if we're looking at shipping out our products, they'll find the best way for that. So yes, logistics do come into it, but also procurement. There's all kinds of things that come in with supply chain. Now, when you look at supply chain management, you're going to deal with a lot of people, and a lot of times you call, oh, we're going to deal with middlemen. Yes, you will deal with middlemen, and you know you don't want to do everything on your own because the middlemen can help you. One, location-wise, look, if our factory here is in India and our customer here is in Illinois, well, that's kind of a far way to go. If we have some middleman here, like a Best Buy store in Champaign, well, hey, that helps us get close to the customer. So the location of our middleman can help us get in co contact with our customers better. Another thing is they're informers. They inform customers why our products are well. They're kind of like a salesman. Okay? They help us sell our products. They inform them, the customers of the benefits. That's why when you go to a store, they ask, hey, what, what, what do you need? What are you looking for? So they can inform you of your options. So middlemen can help with that. Also, they also help with delivery. They're deliverers. You know, they, they help deliver our products out there. They set up things. I mean, think about it. If you're buying all new furniture, does anyone like putting together IKEA furniture? No. Squeak, squeak, squeak. There's my whole weekend gone trying to put together a bed. The middlemen, they can go out there and help our service by, hey, they deliver it and put it together so that can add value to it. Now, having all these middlemen, having all these different links in the supply chain, there's a lot of information going around. You know, the customer here talks to the, to the actual store that sells the product. The customer can also contact the manufacturer. If you get your HDTV from Sony and it doesn't work, yeah, you can complain to Best Buy or you can complain to Sony in Japan. There's all this different information flowing and these guys talk to here and then if you have the suppliers up there, there's all kind of information flowing around and we really need to make sure that we can manage that information because if we don't know, if we're Sony and we don't hear about the complaints that our customers have, well then how can we improve them? We can. That's why you want to, you know, make sure you can track the documents, track that information, and you keep all that information. And the thing is, all that information is out there, they know about you, and believe me, companies know a lot about you, they use that information, they collect it all. When they collect all of it, it's called data warehouse. It's like a big warehouse with all the data on there, all the things you've bought, when you've bought, how much you spend on it, um, you know, which units you like better. Do you like the fun size stickers or the giant size stickers? Who knows, okay? They know these things. And what you do is you have what's called data mining, where you have, imagine this big, huge cube of information, and you mine down in there to find out special things. So they'll look and they have all this data on you, and so they'll mine down in it and say, oh, what do they find out? Ah, when he shops and he buys milk, he's usually buying baby formula as well. So he probably has a baby. Yes, we do. So what we could do is we can have offers for toddler clothes, for toddler food, because we know eventually he's going to do that. So we can tailor the coupons that come on the back of your, of your uh, receipts at a grocery store. They can tailor that for you because they have that information on you. Okay, so as supply chain people, we want to keep all the information and figure out what it says so we can see the trends that are out there, we can see buying patterns and all this kind of stuff. And it is a very hard work, but you want to keep all the information, the data warehousing stuff, and then do data mining to figure out those trends and, and buying patterns out there. Okay? Now, one of the things that really helps with the data transfer and the data warehouse and all these things is if you have an electronic data interchange. 
okay, and or an EDI. And basically what this does is all the documents you we send around in business in our supply chain, if it's computerized, you know, you have a formula, then if it's a computer's form, then I can track it. I can see the trends. I can have the menu say, is this for uh, services? Is this for, you know, product problems? What is it? We can track all these things, and therefore it gives us a way to monitor the data, analyze the data, which is awesome because then we can find things. And by having these EDIs out there, you get a lot of benefits. One thing is you reduce cycle time. The time it takes from ordering to delivery shrinks down because everything's in a standardized form. I mean, think about it. When you go to the ATM, it doesn't matter who's the ATM. It's going to go pretty fast because there's only so many things you can do. If you go up to the, to the window and t or the, the teller, well, it could take forever because maybe you want pennies or nickels or dimes or whatever. Hey, the ATM, automation, boom, in and out. Same thing with EDIs, it makes it so there's not a lot of errors that can go into it, so things get done faster. Also, what's nice about that is it improves the quality of um, our communication because now it's all standardized, so there's no more, I can't read, was that Illinois or Indiana where it's supposed to go? Is that IL or IN? Hey, it's in the system, they have to call it, so you put IN and you put 61822, Wait, 61822 is an Illinois address. Are you sure you have the right thing? So it helps us correct those mistakes. Other things it can do for us, I mean, like I said, it puts the data set in readable form, computer form, so we can analyze it, which is very helpful out there. And sometimes when you look at your supply chain information system, because all this information is going around, sometimes you find it better that maybe inventory management is better done by somebody else. So you have vendor managed inventory, and here you want to be sharing a lot of information with them so they know when you're out of Frito Lace you know, potato chips, so they can get those free delays on their shipments and get them out to you. And, well, for companies, for retailers, this is nice because they do all the work for you, so I don't have to hire a stock boy for the Coca-Cola aisle or a stock girl for the free delay aisle. They come do it for me. But I have to share a lot of information, and the supply chain, a lot of companies don't like to share that information out there. So you have to have a very good, tr very good trusting relationship with your supply suppliers and in your supply chain in order for these things to work. And another thing is when you have collaborative planning, forecasting, and replenishment, okay, basically you're working with your suppliers in order to figure out what is the best way to do things. And you want to plan these things out because if you call Coca-Cola today and say, I need 50,000 cans right now, they might not be able to do it. I mean, think about it. It's like pizza. If I call up Domino's right now and say, I need 100 pizzas for this party in 30 minutes or less, they can't do it. But if I call them and say, hey, next week I need 100 pizzas, they can get it done because then they can arrange the supply chain, have the ovens ready, have all the pizzas ready, getting ready to pop out there, have the Domino's all over the state of Illinois making pizzas. They can get it done, okay? But we have to work together with it, all right? So I hope that gives you an idea of this, what the supply chain does and also, you know, that it's more than just the logistics. Yes, logistics go into it, but all these things kind of integrate together, how information is important there, all kinds of stuff. If you want to learn more about supply chain or marketing, please check us out at our website at www.waltersworld.com. Bye. And sometimes when you look, and sometimes when you look at supply chain and, and planning together, so you say, look, we're looking to do. Um,